Everybody, we're back with another episode of Midnight on Earth. I'm your host, Jake Weaver, and we're here to give you positive information. We're here to help you grow. We're here to help you become a better person than you were before. That's what this whole podcast is about. Today, we're going to have an incredible guest. We're going to talk about naturopathic medicine with Dr. Dan McCartchick. I got that right the first time. That's pretty amazing. Um, and we're going to have an incredible, incredible discussion. Uh, you know, get your coffee. I got my coffee. You know, get I got your, my coffee. He's got his coffee. Get comfortable. Sit in your chair. And let's, let's listen. Let's learn about naturopathic medicine. But first, I have just one thing to say. Don't, I, I, I'm not all about self-promotion, but we got to get this information out there. Go to my Instagram. Go to this Instagram for this podcast at midnight underscore on underscore earth. Follow me, subscribe to me on Spotify. We're, there's so many podcasts out there that we're trying to just get this really cool, really cool information out there. It's how we do it is by you telling people that that's how it happens. I, like I always say, I have a responsibility to do this myself, but I can't do it without you. The listeners, the worldwide listeners, all over the world, all, uh, what, what are we up to? Like 17, 18 countries now. We're up to 18 countries. All of you guys have to tell your friends, tell your neighbors, knock on doors, do whatever it takes <laughs> to get this out there. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you for doing that. Now, we're going to talk to Dr. Dan McCarchick. Do you go by Dr. Dan before we go into your bio? Or do people call you Dr. Dan? Yes, I've been going by Dr. Dan. I feel like it's a little bit easier than uh, Dr. Uh, Bogdan, or if you say it in the traditional Ukrainian, it would be Bogdan. Uh-huh. So I kind of go with Dr. Dan just because it's a little bit easier for people to pronounce. Right. Uh, and a little bit more easily memorable, too. Yeah, so Bogdan, Dr. Bogdan, but we're going to call him Dr. Dan. Dr. Bogdan Makarchuk is a graduate of the Naturopathic Medical Program at NUNM, incredible school, accredited here in Oregon, in 2020. He's also the host of the Herbal Hour podcast, which is a natural health podcast. Highly recommend it. He's also, in addition to everything else, he's the founder of the herbal supplement company, Kentaros Therapeutics. His interests in healing are Jungian psychology, psychedelic medicines, (laughs) we love this, herbalism, and the ancient traditions of the world. He's taught workshops on dream psychology and herbal crafts at places like Portland Community College. And Kentos Therapeutics is his company. Kentaros is the Greek word that means centaur. He's inspired by the legend of Chiron, who is a great healer, teacher, and herbalist. All of that goes into what he designs, his his blends, his company. It it, it kind of goes through that filter. So I just want to say, hello, Dr. Dan. Hello, Jake. It's uh, good to meet you and good to speak with you. Yeah, I'm thank pretty you. excited about this. Thank you for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. We really needed somebody to come on. It was the perfect time. We needed somebody to come on and talk about natural medicine because right now people mm-hmm. are really interested in improving their immune system. They're really interested in being as healthy as they can be, or at the very least healthier. People, I think, really want to be healthier, but we don't want to do it in a way that's assaulting your body with chemicals. We don't want toxins going in your body. We want to do it naturally. We want to increase your health. We want to increase your immunity naturally. So we have Dr. Dan here. He's going to tell us all about natural medicine. 
Absolutely. So <laughs> to go off uh, the point that you brought up, I think it's very important to be proactive about your health rather than reactive. So most of the time we're pretty reactive about our health, right? Uh-huh. We get sick, we take a medicine, you know, we get an injury, we take something to help with that. But most of the time we're not proactive. And that's kind of human nature, unfortunately, is that we usually don't act on a problem until it becomes such a problem that it forces us to. But natural medicine is all about being proactive, meaning how do you support your body so that you don't get sick? And even more than that, how do you support your body so that you are actually in a state of vibrant health where you're not just free of disease, but you're actually healthy, happy, peaceful, calm, your immune system's working great, all your organs are doing great, you're in great physical shape. All this kind of thing is really important for being healthy in the true sense. And unfortunately, our, the conventional medical model in a lot of ways, although it's been quite successful at this, is really focused on purely diseases and treating diseases and not really as much focused on health. And that's not really the fault of any particular person. Um, that's kind of the reason why I got into naturopathic medicine. Uh, yeah, let's, let's hear that story. You know, it's, it's, it's really, but before, you know, let's touch on what you said a little bit. Yeah. People are reactive, right? They, and then, then you go to conventional doctors, not to knock conventional medicine. It has a place, but you go to conventional doctors nine times out of 10, they're treating the symptoms. They're not treating the mm-hmm. cause of the illness. And that's where natural medicines come into play. They're saying be proactive. And then the symptoms don't even manifest because you're already, healthy. You have a strong immune system. You're battle, you're able to battle off these things. And I, is right. that My goal of- as a naturopathic doctor is to basically teach the person how to be their own doctor. Right. That's really the whole goal of natural medicine. It's not like that they have to keep coming back. It's you, you teach people about health, about how to know their bodies, about how to eat properly, about how to move around, about what herbs are helpful, et cetera. Um, and once they know these kind of things, they just need to come in every once in a while for a consult just to make sure they're on track. But it's not this classic relationship with a doctor where, you know, they're on this ivory tower and they know exactly what's right. And you just listen to what they say. Uh, That doesn't, it doesn't work like that because who is a better judge of what's going on in your body than you? Right. And, and, and it's very template based conventional medicine is very template based. So when they come in and they assess you, they don't really get into your emotional state. They don't really get into the dietary things that come into play that can affect you and cause these symptoms. They just kind of look at it as, okay, you have this illness or this symptom. Therefore you fall into this template, which requires this certain treatment based on the template, mm-hmm. which is really that's, interesting. That's, yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot of conventional medicine is based around this kind of uh, algorithm model where, you know, uh, computers could basically do the job in a lot of ways because it's, um, you know, what symptoms do they have? And if they have this symptoms, they have this disease. And if they have that disease, this is the medicine for it. And unfortunately, health isn't that clear cut. Although conventional medicine, I don't want to knock it at all because as a naturopathic doctor, we, we do use pharmaceuticals and we do do lab tests and we do do hormone panels and all that kind of thing and physical exams. So we use a lot of the tools of conventional medicine, but I think it's important to know that they have a certain uh, time and place for use and they're, you know, amazing. It, the amount of life preservation that comes from conventional medicine is it's unbelievable what kind of things um, conventional medicine can help people with and keep them kind of alive. Right. But when it comes to being healthy, there just isn't that tool set. And part of the thing that, uh, in the bio, the aspect of me being interested in the ancient traditions, what really fascinates me is that the Western tradition or the conventional model, it has a naturally holistic uh, ancient uh, heritage. And that's what I'm interested in. Uh, Like Greek medicine, uh, Galen, alchemical medicine, uh, medieval medicine, these kind of things, traditional Western herbalism. These are the Western holistic medicines. They're the holistic health and the natural healing paths. They're still there, but they've kind of been, you know, put to the side. They've been ridiculed by the conventional sphere, even though they're really the underlying aspects of medicine. So yeah, that's I mean, kind of the conventional medicine. Yeah, it seems like sorry to cut you out there, but it seems like conventional medicine was birthed 
from natural medicine, natural medicine coming from primordial prehistory, mm -hmm. ancient cultures, ancient times. And, you know, this conventional medicine evolved from that. But then now they think they're the be all end all, which, in fact, it seems like it's yeah. more of a synthesis, actually leaning a lot more towards natural medicine with this kind of like about maybe 20 percent conventional medicine but mm -hmm. look before we go too deep because we man the we, we got the rapport it's there it's rapid fire i want to know your history i want to know what got you into natural medicine what made you sign up for nunm like what what is that road what was the road to that degree so i could start this back very far but i'll start this kind of more recently so when i was in uh, undergrad at Stony Brook University in New York. I was studying philosophy. At that time, I was very interested in uh, meditation and Buddhism and learning about all the different religious traditions of the earth and kind of was on this path to better understand myself, better understand the world. And I always just found that stuff very fascinating. Naturally, out of that came this interest in bodily health. Like, what herbs do I take? How do I eat right? It just kind of naturally flowed I think when you're when you become more conscious or you kind of wake up for lack of a better term, all these things that you may have not thought of, like what you're eating or, you know, what you're putting in your body, uh, what the political situation is, they become important and you kind of start digging in. So that's kind of where I was at the time I was, you know, taking different herbal supplements, experimenting with things, taking powders. I love going to the gym, like working out and maximizing benefits from that. Um, but I really had no idea that I would go into healing at this point. Actually, I thought I was going to be a philosophy professor or something. Cause I've always loved teaching. In fact, I am teaching now, but now I'm teaching natural medicine stuff. Um, but, but yeah, so I had a natural inclination to teach and I thought I'd be a, a philosophy professor or something. So isn't that interesting uh, though, Bogdan is like, isn't that interesting that when you study spiritual things, you study philosophical things because kind of philosophical things are spiritual. Kind of, they kind of go hand in hand, right? Yeah, really, I see them the same way. You can't really separate. I mean, all the great philosophers, except for maybe like one or two, like they were like the super outliers. <laughs> they were like, yeah, nothing's don't, don't, real. Don't read those ones. Yeah, nothing's don't real. Everything They'll make you very sad. <laughs> <Yeah>. But 99% <laughs> of them believed in not something bigger than themselves. You know, something mm -hmm. you call it God, whatever it is, they integrated the spiritual world into their lives. So you're saying that then once you delved real deep into philosophy, you then the byproduct of that was get having a better diet, being healthier. And it's almost like a natural progression mm -hmm. because you get the spirit. You can't be Certainly spiritual. Is. You can't have a functioning spiritual body when you're getting attacked by toxins, toxins in the food, toxins in the air, wherever these toxins are coming from, once you get aware, you, you start to limit that. You're like, wait, I don't want these toxins coming in. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that about yourself? Yeah, I, I think it's largely a function of the community that you enter into when you become interested in spirituality, which is just overall, let's call it the holistic alternative community. <laughs> and that includes alternative religious practices like, like mysticism that includes alternative diets like vegetarianism. So I was a vegetarian for a while, uh, a pescatarian for like six years. Uh, so like all that, that's kind of like tied, it's tied in somehow with that holistic community. Uh, it makes sense because they're fundamentally, these are alternative views to what, you know, is commonly believed, what we're commonly told is the truth which obviously hasn't led to amazing results. So it's anybody who seeks uh, a different way in life or seeks some meaning in life, they'll kind of naturally stumble upon these different uh, spheres. And that's kind of what happened to me. Okay. Uh, but going, going back to uh, where I was there. So I'm in school. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do uh, in undergrad. And uh, my parents were, uh, were suggesting a lot to me to go into like uh, osteopathic medicine or uh, become a medical doctor, an MD. Uh, so my parents both originally, so I'm from Ukraine. I was born in Ukraine. I came to the United States when I was about four years old. And my parents in Ukraine were both doctors. My dad was a surgeon. My mom was in internal medicine. And when they came to the United States, my mom went into um, doing echocardiology 
eventually. And my, my dad is currently a, a surgeon with the same name as me. So if you, if you look up Bogdan Makarchuk on Google, you'll just see like 12 things about, you know, a general surgeon in New York. That's, that's not me. That's my dad. Okay. Uh, so I actually that was kind noticed of like a that. natural. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> I did actually notice that. That's funny. You brought that up. Yeah. So that was uh, kind of, I was being pushed in the way of going into a healing path, but I didn't really necessarily want to go in the MDDO path because I, I saw like kind of the medical system and what it was and just didn't like really agree with me. I, at that, even at that time, I was, I would prefer an herb over a pharmaceutical. I would prefer herb over, uh, over the counter any day of the week. So I, I just felt like it wasn't really the right place for me. So as I was kind of trying to figure out, well, what do I do? I kind of thought of like a compromise and the compromise was I was looking around for different programs that exist and I found naturopathic medicine and it seemed, uh, you know, it seemed very promising. I looked at, it, I was like this, so this is basically pretty much like an MD, but we do, um, we focus on the natural things too, like diet, uh, herbs you can use mentality, spirituality. Those things are actually looked into in this uh, sphere. So, I figured I would just kind of do that. And as I was finishing up school, I still wasn't sure. I was like trying to decide between DO because uh, osteopathic medicine, if you're not familiar, uh, DOs, they basically function pretty much the same way as MDs do, but they have a little bit more of a holistic philosophy, although largely their main osteopathic manipulation, which makes up their profession and makes it really holistic, is not really paid attention to by many osteopathic physicians. So. Uh, it's, it was more holistic than MD, but it just wasn't enough for me. Um, and when I, you know, learned there was a school here in, in Portland and what the scope of practice was here. So here in uh, Oregon, if you're not familiar with naturopathic doctors, they can prescribe like 98% of pharmaceuticals. There's certain ones like really, uh, yeah, uh, chemotherapies they can't prescribe and some like really intense psychiatric medicines they can't prescribe. But other than that, they can prescribe anything. They can prescribe hormones, they can prescribe antibiotics. And in fact, mm. a lot of NDs that you'll go to these days, they do actually use a lot of those kind of things. Has it always Not been that every... way or has it progressed within the last five to 10 years? It's progressed within the last five or 10 years. Okay. The traditional naturopath was, you know, no drugs at all. They were all herbs. They were all lifestyle, all diet. These days, it's more of like an integrative model for a uh, naturopathic doctor. So some of them you might go in and you might not even notice that they're much different than an MD. Uh, they might just ask you more questions or have a longer visit. But others, uh, such as myself, might have a really deep focus on herbalism specifically, or they might really want to see uh, how like your mind is influencing your health, such as myself. So the thing with naturopathic doctors is they're, they're so different. Like there's so many different kinds of them. Uh, so naturopathic medicine isn't even really just even one thing. It's basically founded around the principle of, uh, the healing power of nature, treating the root cause of disease, treating the whole person, preventing disease, teaching the uh, patient. We have these kind of philosophical principles, which is part of what attracted me to the medicine that every naturopath, uh, follows along with, but they do it in different ways. So anyway, so I set out, I decided I'll just, I'll do the school. And then I, so it's a four-year program and I started, I guess in 2016 and we learn a lot of conventional med uh, medical uh, knowledge. Like we learn anatomy, physiology. We have, we, we work with cadavers, which are, you know, dead, sure. dead corpses. Wow. Uh, and to learn about <laughs> bodies. So we, we do a lot of the classic things that uh, MDs do. Sure. Uh, but then we also learn about, we learn about herbs, nutrition. We learn about exercise. And really, I learned the most out of everything from the people that came there. Because the people that came there already had their own interests. And they were always interested in talking about, you know, their view on health. So I learned so much from just really my colleagues and, and classmates at the time. Yeah. I'm sure um, to go to that school, you have to be very self uh, motivated. Your focus is very specialized. So you mm -hmm. took, you, you're already self-taught pretty much before you get there. You're just going to get the finer details and also the degree. Yeah. A lot of people already had a, a background in understanding a lot about health and 
from a natural perspective or from a holistic perspective, at least that's the reason they went to the school, right? Cause that right. appealed to them. Otherwise they would have just done MD or DO and then maybe they would have become more holistically minded as their career went on, so which is, is your, also an option. So is your practice like doing really well right now? Because it seems like natural medicine is really taking off, especially the style that you practice, which is almost like a fusion of conventional and, and uh, naturopathic medicine. It seems like it's really gaining in popularity. Do you notice your practice growing? How is that working out for you? Yeah, as far as my practice, so I'm starting my practice actually in spring. A lot of the yeah, you're fresh graduate. Uh, kind of COVID and uh, lockdown stuff kind of shifted around my plan. So I've been sure. I've been teaching, I've been working on my company, uh, and I've been kind of doing the odd herbal consult for for people while I wait. But really, the big plan is to start the practice in uh, spring. Okay, I, yeah, I can comment on uh, some of my colleagues and. Um, it's definitely, it's harder for naturopathic doctors because even though there's such a big interest in people uh, seeing them and they, uh, wanting that natural health, there's not really an infrastructure set up for naturopathic doctors. They're not you know, fully accepted by the system. So a lot of them have to be kind of lone rangers. Like your main options are really just to start your own private practice. There's not really much, uh, there is some naturopathic doctors that work at hospitals, but that's not really typical um, and that kind of thing. So most of them are most of them are entrepreneurs, basically. Most yeah, in order to be successful, it sounds like you have to start your own practice because the infrastructure is not there. Maybe they'll have like one or two staff naturopaths at a big hospital, but usually they hire internally. So they're not actually out there, you know, looking for naturopaths to hire from the street. So you got to be, if you were self motivated to go to these schools and learn this thing, you also have to be self motivated, rent a space, create your own practice. And I'm sure the insurance companies are a little bit hard to deal with because probably some of them accept some of the treatments and some of them reject it. And then you got to figure out which ones mm -hmm. are the right ones, right? Yeah. So uh, naturopathic doctors can accept uh, most insurances. And oh, good. in fact, they do. Uh, and so that's how a lot of naturopathic doctors get uh, their practices up and running is by accepting insurance. Personally, I'm not planning on accepting insurance unless anything uh, happens. And I have a lot of specific reasons for that. Uh -huh. Um, and this is just my personal opinion. Sure, uh, sure, and yeah. What I've heard from a lot of naturopathic doctors who did take insurance and strongly recommended against it, and people might be asking, well, why would you not take insurance? It's so helpful for people who don't have the means to pay. It's basically because much of what the issue is with conventional medicine is due to the insurance companies. Uh, and let me elaborate further on what that actually means. Sure. The way doctors practice is directly controlled by how insurance companies reimburse, aka how they pay for services. So the reason why MDs only see you for 10 minutes isn't because they don't care about you. It's because insurance will only pay a certain amount for what's called a visit, right? And that visit could be seven hours long and they're still going to only pay you a hundred bucks. Oh. So it doesn't matter how long they spend. All that matters is like what boxes they check off. Like, did they do a physical exam? Did they give a treatment? Did they give a diagnosis? And they could do that in five minutes or they could do that in three hours. So they choose to do it in five minutes so that their practices can stay in business because the overhead costs are so ridiculous for starting a clinic. So much of what the issue with conventional medicine is, is not the fault of doctors. It's actually the fault of the uh, medical system. And it's the fault specifically of how insurance companies reimburse payments. So a lot of naturopathic doctors, they do take insurance because they're kind of in desperation to, because they need to get that money in. Yeah, and they, bring they need some a lot work. Of patients. And a lot of people do have insurance and that's, there's a good portion of the population that will not pay out of pocket for health services. So to reach those people, you need to. Take yeah, you have to. But then they're forced into these ways of practicing where, you know, they can only see patients for like 15 minutes or if they see them for an hour, they won't really get reimbursed well. And the fundamentals of naturopathic medicine or any holistic healing is you really want to get the full story of the person. You want to know, you know, their early life. You want to know everything about their diet. You want to know how they think about life you really go into all the aspects of what makes a human being a human being. So that's what's called holistic. It's the 
whole picture. Sure. And you can't do that in 10 minutes. Like no matter how <laughs> good you are, it's just not possible. Right. But insurance won't pay you for being like a holistic doc. So that's personally why I, I don't plan on uh, at least focusing my practice around insurance. I may take insurance here and there depending on what patients need. Well, but it, I want to be able to practice in the way that I think will be most beneficial for people, not sure. just Sure. There, yeah. And there's an energetic aspect too. It's like, if you're a healer and you're working, you know, you're using your energy to heal people and you have a set up form of compensation, you know, you're getting 10% of that. It doesn't feel the same, you know, and, and you're a human being and you want to be compassionate and you want to kind of turn that off and be like, ah, but the energy isn't the same as somebody that's being appropriately compensated for their work. Like when a person gets appropriately compensated, they feel very supercharged and they feel mm -hmm. respected and, and worthy. And then they're subconsciously giving their absolute best because you know, that's their service. And then the patient benefits. So ultimately these insurance companies are just screwing everybody up. You know, yeah. they're screwing the Basically. people up from getting the best service. They're screwing up the doctors for not, getting the right amount of money. It, it's unfortunate, but it makes sense. But in time, yeah. we could change that. In time, we could change it. And it is changing. Yeah. And it is changing. Right. You said even the last five to 10 years, there's been growth. There's going to be more growth, you know. So getting your practice set up now is really the best thing you can do. And then as the mm -hmm. insurance laws and the insurance protocols change in the future, it might be way more beneficial for you to take insurance. What's changing ins insurance currently in the past like decade is consumer pressure. So when people really like write letters to the insurance company saying, hey, like this, I pay so much for insurance, this should cover acupuncture, this should cover naturopathy. Only when they're directly pressured by consumers will they actually change their practices. Oh. So in these days, there are some big name insurance companies that do cover naturopathic services, that do cover acupuncture, massage, that kind of stuff. Those are usually really higher end private insurances. But it, it is possible to make that change. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff still going on with insurance, like for example, naturopathic doctors and MDs, even if they do the same service, they get paid differently by insurance. So they could do literally the same service. Like let's say an MD gives you a vaccine or an ND gives you a vaccine. The ND might be paid less for the exact same amount of time, for the exact same service, for the exact same insurance coding. Coding means like that's the number you put in to say that you did that service and that's how insurance knows how much to pay you. So there's a lot of unfairness going on in insurance when it comes to the alternative models. And I know that's also the case for acupuncturists, Chinese med docs. Unfortunately, herbalists aren't even accepted within the system because they're not accredited in any, uh, unless they're under a different degree. So they're not even, there's no insurance that's going to pay for an herbalist. Yeah. Currently herbalists are at the bottom of the proverbial totem pole when it comes to respect from conventional medicine. You know, chiropracting mm -hmm. took forever to get accepted into the mainstream. And they then did. And they know, fought hard for it. They, they did. were fought against. <laughs> they very fought hard. very hard against chiropractic care, but chiropractic care won out because like Bogdan saying, uh, Dr. Dan, he's telling you, send a letter. You know, if you, if you, if you pay for medical insurance and you're a listener, please just shoot an email, tell your insurance yeah. company exactly what you want for your money. You want the best possible care. You want natural care and you want to have the options to have natural care and you want the doctors to be appropriately compensated. You want them to get them. And if enough people did that, the system would change. It would. But that's the kind of, uh, that's like the secret to this, you know, system of capitalism is that, you know, the consumer really has all the power if they understand that. But most uh, most people, they kind of just follow along with what's conventional or what they're taught or these, these kind of things that aren't even in their best interests. Um, and a lot of people have a lot of false notions of what even naturopathic medicine is because they'll read the Wikipedia page, which is just a straight up like propaganda slam piece against naturopathic doctors. Um, that's well, what are those filled what, with misinformation? Well, what are some of those misconceptions? Let's clear up a couple of those. If you can, if you know off the top of your head, I mean, Oh, they start off hot. Like in the first sentence, they say it's a pseudoscience. Oh, like in nice. the first sentence, <laughs> I would highly uh, contest that fact. In fact, my experience of naturopathic medical school is that 
we probably learned about like 75% typical conventional medical practices, like anatomy, physiology, pathology, all the ologies, you know, uh, okay. diseases, uh, even learn pharmaceuticals uh, Our on our, um, our final examinations, like board examinations, we, uh, we take tests on pharmacology and things like that. So, because we can use them. So I, there's a, there's a lot of distinction because the weird thing with naturopathic medicine is that it's not regulated in every state. Mm-hmm. It's only regulated in about half of the states, meaning that in states where it's not regulated, like New York, for example, anyone can call themselves a naturopath. Anyone. Really? Anyone. Even they, in New they York? They don't even need like some, yeah. They that's don't even crazy. need, and, I, and actually the first naturopathic college was in New York. So that's a, that's a, an <laughs> irony, in fact. Because that's where the original naturopathic college was uh, that was founded in the early 1900s. So do you think because um, of that, it left kind of a bad taste in some people's mouths because they saw people that were unaccredited charlatans and then they based their perspective off their treatment? There was a lot of political stuff going on and some professions got basically completely squashed. In fact, naturopathic medicine was one of those that just recently came back within the last few decades because it was almost completely obliterated by the political forces that were uh, reforming health at the time, as were a lot of other medical schools. You don't have to go very far back. If you go back into the early 1900s, late 1800s, there is no one medicine. There is eclectic physicians, there's naturopathic doctors, there's uh, medical doctors, there's chiropractors, and they're all on equal footing in the law. There's no like this is the conventional and then this is the BS. There's there was no ideas like that back then. It was just the idea and the in the general idea was there's just a lot of different kinds of doctors you can go to. And that's how it was for a while. But of course, money interests, um, specifically Rockefeller Foundation was directly involved in reforming healthcare to standardize medical schools and not allow certain things to be taught. Uh, And that basically shut down a lot of the naturopathic colleges and almost decimated the profession. So there's a lot of political stuff going on when it comes to healthcare. Um, And you may have noticed, I mean, the conventional medical model is completely broken. And largely that is because of this, these political forces that are acting, these, um, what's all profit companies that are acting exactly. And that, is directly contrary to the interest of what's best for the patient. So <laughs> really who suffers is the patient. It's awful. Um, but they're they're told to believe that that is really the best way because that's part of the propaganda because they have a lot of money and they can, you know, make Wikipedia articles and slam articles uh, just completely smearing whole professions without any facts. So um, if you're into interested in like uh, natural medicine or naturopathic medicine, I highly recommend you just go see a naturopathic doctor who's you know well well reviewed, well rated, and see for yourself what it is, and don't necessarily believe what comes up on Google because there's a lot of political stuff going on. Um, and I'll tell you from my experience of my colleagues uh-huh. is that naturopath doctors are some of the most open-minded people, and they're they're they even you know a lot of times doubt what they do and they try to look in deeper. They don't. They're not dogmatic. A lot of times they'll, uh, they'll give you the pharmaceutical if that's what they think is right. They're not like dogmatic, like all pharmaceuticals are evil. Well, you you look at the, well, if you look at the root, a lot of these pharmaceuticals, they're naturally based. Mm -hmm. I mean, even opiates, you think of opium, but you know, across the board, aspirin space from a tree bark, there's all different kinds of medicines that are considered chemical medicines that are actually naturally Mm -hmm. based, which is the incredible irony of the whole thing, because it's almost like, they're, they're cutting off their roots, like these medical people. And as a person that studied the history, not just natural medicine, but you've studied the history of natural medicine throughout cultures around the world, it, they're cutting, completely cutting off their roots and, and not realizing the value in that. What are some of the things, Bogdan, what are some of the things from these ancient cultures that you feel like could be lost or, or overlooked in how people are, treat themselves medically? What are some of the things you've learned that are really unique? That are like, wow, that that are that are ancient, that come from ancient times. It's a great question, and there, there's there's a lot there's a lot to say on that. Um, I'll give one uh, one example though. So one of the notions from Ayurveda, which is the traditional uh, Indian medicine, very fascinating uh, form of holistic medicine because it is by all accounts, over 4,000 years old. 
So this is among the oldest uh, human recorded medicine or medical practice. This is included. based in India. Yes, based in India, in that uh, in that kind of area. Of course, that area wasn't as clearly uh, delineated as a, a nation state as it is today, four thousand years ago. But it's you know that general <laughs> region and that and those people. Sure. Um, so just to give you that example of Ayurveda, so Ayurveda, it literally means something like the science of life or the science of longevity. So this is where I'll kind of start to answer your question. Sure. So in Ayurveda, the whole person's life is part of the healing treatment. It's not just, you know, you get sick and you take this medicine. That's part of it. But it's also, you know, how is that person thinking? What is their mind state? How are they eating? Uh, how are they moving around? And Ayurveda has this beautiful concept of constitutional types. And constitutional types are kind of like different essential health and body types that people have. And there's three of them in Ayurveda, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. And they correspond to kind of um, different body types. Some people within the Western tradition might have heard terms uh, like ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph. Okay. Those are kind of uh, related to these body types where like some people are very high nervous system. They're very intellectual. Their moods change a lot. They tend to be really skinny. They tend to be cold. Then there's people a little bit larger set uh, tend to be kind of sluggish. Then there's people who are very ambitious, muscular. Like those are just really, really general uh, generalities. And uh, where would those people fall? Like those characteristics you just talked about, where would they fall in those definitions? Yeah, so uh, Pitta would be like the ambitious, fiery, intense, prone to irritability type. Okay. Kapha would be kind of the larger, more dull, compassionate, very emotional, tend to be a larger frame type, no matter how they eat. Then there's like the Vata, which is kind of, I'm a strong Vata, so very, um, my mind's kind of going here and there, and uh, nervous system's very active, my mind's very active. Uh skinny naturally long long limbs these are just all the different characteristics that you could know the constitutional types but where the beauty comes in is that they had a system devised of you know these are the diets these are the ways of living these are the herbs this is the way of thinking this is the exercise that goes along with this constitutional type that you are which is a completely different notion because modern medicine is statistic based it's not based on there being some kind of differences between people. Uh, modern medicine is all people are blank slates and research, you know, if this medicine works for people with diabetes, then it works for everybody with diabetes, but it doesn't take into account how every individual is different. And you don't have to really know much about health to know. You might've noticed some of your friends are just fundamentally different than you. They have different kinds of issues with their health that are constant. They have different personalities. They have different motivations. Certain things are easier. They have strengths, they have weaknesses. Uh, and this system had this uh, basically delineated or you know characterized as, as different types that you would give different herbs to. So somebody, let's say somebody with like a, a respiratory infection or something, depending on what type they are within the uh, constitutional types of Ayurveda, you would treat them differently. So if they were a pitta type, you would give them cooling herbs. If they were a vata type, you would give them warming herbs. So that means even for the same, even for two people with the same condition, you would actually treat them differently because their constitutional type is different, which means they have certain proclivities to having uh, energetic imbalances in their body. So that's just one of the, you know, thousand things that I could talk about that ancient uh, cult, uh, cultures and traditions had that are like these fundamental ideas. In fact, this constitutional type idea exists in medieval medicine and Greek medicine. It's the idea of the humors, right? So how, how does it. that show up in the Greek medicine? Is that the humors that you're talking about? Yeah, it is the humors. Yeah, let's exactly. talk about that. What are the humors? Yeah, the humors are, uh, there's melancholic, there's uh, sanguine, uh, there's uh, choleric, and I think that yeah, I think that there's just three, maybe there's four. I might be, I might be mixing something. I might come back to me. But anyway, the, <laughs> the because there's a uh, yellow bile, black bile, blood, and phlegm. And it's all so actually there's four humors. So there's that. So the humors, like if you, if you're having like black bile, then you know that it filters into a certain humor. 
Is that what exactly be a symptom of the humor? Yeah, the humors were kind of this like fluid, energetic substance that would be in imbalance in the body. And certain people would have uh, certain tendencies to have an abundance or a deficiency in one of the humors, and they would uh-huh. manifest certain diseases because of it. So that's where the constitutional types um, come in. So isn't that interesting that that knowledge seemed to manifest in different cultures, you know, maybe not, maybe not completely isolated, but definitely different. And then they are able to tap into the same thing. And I believe there's other cultures that have the constitutional perspective as well, right? It's not just Greek and and Indian. It's what are some of the other ones? uh, It's typical throughout really just the holistic systems. Um, So the entire ancient world, everybody's got their kind of their own version of the constitutional medicine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I can give you even some modern examples of sure. the yeah, let's hear constitutions. It. Personality types. You guys might have heard of um, Myers Briggs. You know, the like INFJ, INTP, these kind of letter systems that define your personality. Okay. So this system is um, is a kind of constitutional types, but it's of the personality and of the mind. So it's not really focused necessarily on the body as these other systems were which is this beautiful idea within the humors and the the uh the different um vata pitta kapha the tridosha they call it in ayurveda the mind and body are completely connected there's no separation they don't think like you have this mind constitution if you this body it's like no you have this mind body constitution and that influences everything but in the tradition of personality types uh so carl jung was a big proponent of this and did a lot of research in his patients he was a psychiatrist um yeah, but very more of famous. a mystical bent yeah absolutely uh if you have any interest in personality types i highly recommend one of his works i think it's called something like personality types literally <laughs> it's this long work that goes in uh, you may have heard some of the types like introvert, extrovert. They've been become a part of the popular culture, but they were these really deep, um, filled with information and insight ideas of what an introvert and what an extrovert is and what um, what a feeling type is, what a thinking type is, what an intuitive type is, and what a sensitive type is, or like literally a sensation-based type. Uh, Myers-Briggs took that system that Carl Jung created and added uh, perception and judgment to it. That's where you get the four letters, like INFP, INFJ. The original system for Carl Jung was only the first three letters. Um, Anyway, so those are systems of personality types that really show you how is best to interact with people and explains a lot of the fundamental differences between people. Like some, is there somebody in your life maybe that you just can't agree with? You just can't see like how they see it all. The, the system of personality types basically says that both of you are right, but you're both right through your own perspective, which is just like fundamentally different on the deepest level that you can only like try to understand each other, but you never really fully will because it's the personality types, uh, are like, you know, somebody who can see color and somebody who can't. The person who can see color trying to explain what colors are. And the other person being like, that's BS. I can't see that. And I don't think that's real. And that's literally like the difference between the types. They, they're they all different uh, perceptions of uh, the world, basically. So this so that's was another system. Yeah. So this was just like a new way to bring that, I guess, into the 20th century and just kind of adapt it for Western medicine. This is kind of Absolutely. constitutional outlook, I, but it's just really interesting that even with that, it's, we've lost, I feel like in a general kind of consciousness sense, I feel like we've lost our interconnectedness and our understanding that we can see things from different perspectives, but both mm-hmm. equally be right. I think mm-hmm. that's really hard for people to understand. They, I think people have been programmed in this century, the 21st century. I think that people have been programmed that we kind of all have this very similar general perception of reality and, and what is right or wrong, these moral and ethical codes. But in fact, people are radically different in how they process information and how the information goes in, how they process it and then how they react to their outside world. We've kind of, I think that's kind of gone by the wayside. I think that if people realize that the vast majority of people are fundamentally different from each other, 
but then together in the same, but how we process information is different. I think that that's kind of been, been kind of pushed by the wayside. Yeah, it really has. And it, it would solve a lot of the conflicts between people because you would come to understand it, not in terms of right versus wrong, but in terms of really just somebody fundamentally viewing things differently that somebody you could actually learn from because they see the world in a way that you can't really. Right. So there's a lot of, these systems are actually ways of uniting people rather than separating people, which is kind of interesting because literally the system is separating people, but it's a way to understand how people are different so that fundamentally they can become uh, more harmonious with each other. Which is the root of all healing. That's like the root of all healing. And Carl Jung had this genius idea that uh, all these theoretical systems that came from people like, let's say, you know, Aristotle or Plato, you know how they differed fundamentally. I don't know if you're familiar with ancient philosophy. A little bit. Yeah, they I, just, I'm pretty familiar. They fundamentally differed from each other. And uh, Carl Jung's point was that they're both right, but they're literally different types. So the, the truth, the theory and the philosophy that they came up with is really based on their experience of the world and other people who experience it like them. So you can actually, based on what somebody's interested in, like if they're really into Aristotle, they're really into Plato, you know what kind of personality they are. I'm personally a Plato type. Me and too. I know that because <laughs> I'm more of an intuitive, uh, I see patterns and that's how Plato thought. Aristotle's more of a sensitive type, meaning he's very like, this is reality. This is what's in front of me. This is what's real. Everything else is not like, that's just abstract. And some people are like that. And I know people who really thought Aristotle was really way more on point. And I was just like, he's, you know, amazing to study. He's really the fundamental, he basically created science. I mean, if you want to learn about science, learn about Aristotle, because that guy was a genius 2000 years ago, talking about stuff that we're really still trying to understand. Um, But I still like Plato more because that's my natural temperament. I tend to see the world in terms of patterns. I'm more into spirituality, meaning. Right. The ethereal so I find that system better. Yeah. yeah Cause Less that's concrete. how I am as a, as a person. And that doesn't mean Aristotle's wrong and that Plato's right. It means that Plato talks about a system that accords more with my reality and helps me live better in my reality. So that's an important way to view differing viewpoints is that they come from different temperaments. In fact, Carl Jung even said that after, you know, all, all of his massive amount of work that he did, that this is all really just from my perspective of the person that I am. Right. And uh, really, it's just like uh, you can gain a little bit from each perspective. You can gain from Plato. You can gain from Aristotle, which, like you said, are fundamentally opposed. And and then you can use that information to build your own perspective. I think that's where a lot of people get caught up in these rigid kind of viewpoints where things have to be a certain way. And it's just not the case. I mean, without the ethereal, without the the imaginary we would, nebul- we would never be able to manifest things that are new. We would never be able to create because going mm-hmm. into those places is the ethereal realm. It is the place that's not concrete, that's not sensory because you're imagining, you're going beyond senses. So you, you need, but then you need the Aristotle perspective to bring it into form. You have to understand mm-hmm. the to natural laws out. and all that things. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah. Like, uh, uh- there's a system also of per, uh, personality. Uh, it's called the big five personality types. Okay. And that's what's used traditionally now. Like that's the conventional uh, psychological understanding of personality types. There's types like uh, open and neurotic um, and a few other, they're kind of slipping my mind right now. But basically my point is that uh, Plato types are more open-minded and Aristotle types are, are more, um, I think what do they call them? Uh, conscientious. Conscientious. So conscientious okay. types are like, they're kind of ambitious. They're like right to the point. Show me what's real. I don't want to, you know, talk about all this woo stuff. They're those kind of type of people. And really, even in like a business structure, um, you want two opposing types to be in the business, actually, because they totally balance each other out. Because the creative open-minded type just like comes up with ideas all the time and it's just like too much and they, they have a hard time bringing them into reality. But the conscientious type can like take an idea and just run with it in a straight line and they help balance out the, the open-minded type because they'll shut down a lot of their ideas. Whereas 
open minds type will have so many ideas that they can't even act on any of them. Well, it's kind of like the interesting metaphor of like uh, conventional and natural medicine. I mean, you could say the conventional medicine is the Aristotle and the natural medicine is the Plato, right? Because that's the a, natural, that's a good point. I haven't thought about it. Like yeah. That. Well, the natural medicine is embracing the ethereal things is tapping into intuition and the inf- all the information that comes from those dimensions. And whereas the conventional medicine is just like, what's right in front of me? What's right now? Like, I, I don't want to hear about the woo woo stuff. I don't care about your life story. I just know that you're, you have these symptoms. Therefore you get this treatment. Mm. That's actually a really good point. And that, that brings the interesting uh, implication of how they can be useful to each other. Exactly. The issue with conventional medicine is that sometimes it's too hard, meaning it's too rigid. It's too materialistic that it'll miss a lot of these holistic therapies that actually work. And on the other side, the holistic therapies, naturopathic medicine, and uh, these kind of things, they can just get a little bit too far out there sometimes and not be even grounded in reality and not be effective. And I, I know of, you know, I've learned of tons of different therapies and I've learned about some therapies and I was just like, I don't even think that works. What would be some of those therapies that don't, that you feel like in your opinion doesn't work? Okay. So there's a, there's a lot of specific ones. So there's this notion even within the natural healing circles that you could basically cure everything with essential oils or something like that. <laughs> like this kind of notion, you know what I'm saying? I was saying seriously, it's kind of a joke. Okay. You heard it, right? You of course. The Instagram post where they're like, you know, use peppermint oil to cure cancer. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh. I know. And that's it what really, I mean when it gets too far. That's, that's what really I mean hard. when it just like loses the rails. That's why you need conventional medicine to be like, show me the research, right? But sometimes conventional medicine does that too much and they really throw out the baby with the bathwater and they throw out all natural things just because some of them are ludicrous. So that's just an example of, uh, and I tend to be very like even-minded and kind of find myself to be balancing between the two do, and see the beauties in both. How them. do you feel about uh, like Reiki and, and other types of energy healing? Yeah, I actually uh, got a certification in Reiki. I got to level two. I never got to a uh, master level. That was like when I first started. This is before I went to school. Uh-huh. Um, how do I feel about it? I honestly don't know. I don't know what it is because I've done it on friends and I've had kind of like really positive results, but I don't know like how it works. And I don't know. I've read a little bit about different theories of how these things may work, like the uh bioelectric or biomagnetic energies of the body. And maybe there's some kind of like influence of somebody's, uh, you know, hands and their energetic fields, uh, magnetic field on another person. And this is measurable stuff. This isn't me making sure, it up. Sure, like you sure, can yeah. actually measure the magnetic field of a person's body. Cause it is. So that's like curly in photography. Like you know that curly in photography. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it works like that. I'm, I don't, I honestly really don't know. You know, I, um, I had good experiences with it. You know, one time I even, I'll share a story of when I did sure. Reiki and I, I was like skeptical even when I was doing it. Um, so my friends had like this really bad stomach ache and he was like, you know, just visibly in pain. We were like hanging out in my house. And this is when I just, you know, recently started doing Reiki and he's just in a lot of pain. And I was like, okay, like, let me see if I can do something to help. I'm like, this is a good chance to see if it's useful and, you know, see if I could be of help. So I, I gave him some ginger tea, which is like the best thing for nausea ever. But I also told him, okay, lay down. And then, you know, I, I did Reiki, did Reiki on him for like 10 or 15 minutes. And as I was doing like Reiki, his stomach started like gurgling and moving around and all this stuff. And within like five minutes uh, after I did it, he just jumped up and he was like, oh my God, like I feel so much better. Uh, whereas before he was literally like hunched over, like pale looking, like sick That's from pain. Really interesting. So I don't know like what it was like. I don't know how it works. Uh, I did give him ginger tea too. So that could be part of it. But that's the thing with like holistic medicine is one really has to remove this, uh, this fundamental notion of this one thing caused the healing. Because like it doesn't work like that. Sometimes... Sometimes you give three different things and there's no healing and you give four things and then there's healing. Is it the fourth thing that caused the healing or is it the combination of all the things that causes the healing? I, I tend to think of it as the latter where some combination of the relaxation, 
some aspect of the, the placebo effect, some aspect of the ginger tea, and then maybe some aspect of the magnetic energy also led to his healing. So it was a lot of things. Why? Well, and, and it's interesting you brought up the placebo effect because um, the people, you know, like these conventional medicine people that would believe that natural medicine is a pseudoscience, such a horrible thing to believe. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, they would say, oh, it's all psychosomatic. Like they're just believing it's like faith healing. Right. They're just believing that. But, you know, even that <laughs> that belief that 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 getting in that frequency, that vibration of I am being healed is in itself a healing force. Right. Mm hmm. I, I a million percent agree. And when people say uh, things about the placebo effect, I'm just like, why wouldn't you want to use it? It works. Right. It works. I mean, it doesn't mean you should like intentionally deceive your patients, but it means to me, it means let's stop calling it the placebo effect. Let's call it the mind body effect and let's learn how to harness it instead of trying to discount it. Right. Because it's, it works because that's why they proven. have to literally take it out of research Every research study has a placebo control because it works so often that it's a fundamental problem to science to explain how it works. So I think instead of trying to discount it, we think, how can we utilize it? Right. And that personally is where we get into shamanism. So the placebo effect largely functions around a few different factors. There's a good amount of research about what makes a placebo effect happen. Firstly, there's certain people that are more susceptible to placebo effects and some people who are not susceptible at all. So there's some kind of personality or constitutional thing to it. Another thing is, is the practitioner trusted? The more trust the person has for their physician, the more likely the placebo effect will happen. Two, do they have trust for the medicine? Meaning, do they actually fundamentally believe that it can work? That affects whether the placebo effect will work or not. It also affects um, all different factors affect the placebo effect. Like if you give them a yellow pill they'll and tell them it's energizing, they're more likely to get energized than if you give them a blue pill and told them it's energizing. So the That's color so of it wild. has an effect. And it also, the intensity of the ritual experience, and I think this is the most important part, is the biggest factor in how the placebo effect works. So there's tons of studies, and you guys can look them up for yourself if you're doubtful about the placebo effect, where They've had people with, you know, needing surgeries, like internal surgeries or having injuries or other kind of things where they had to get a surgery. And they did research studies where they put the person under anesthesia, they cut them open and they sewed them up without doing anything. The person woke up, they thought they got a surgery and they got better. And the person, the doctor did nothing internally. Like they didn't change anything. They literally just cut them open, sewed them up and they woke up. Somehow I feel like the so, bill was the same though. It probably was the same. <laughs> <laughs> probably but that's was mind for blowing. experimental that, research. Yeah, exactly. That's crazy though to think about that they even did these studies and they still, I mean, you know, we, we feel like we're so advanced. We're so evolved with our 21st century medical science. We still can't even figure out how the mind itself influences healing. We just know that it works, that it has an effect. And they do these studies to prove that. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. And even in a field like surgery, where it seems like everything should just be really cut and dry, the placebo effect still works in surgery, wow. which is the most physically based therapy that exists. I mean, you're directly interfacing physically with organs. So why is it's not even medicine? So why is conventional medicine, in a general sense, afraid of natural medicine? Now, beyond the profit motive beyond the pharmaceutical companies and, and all that's gained from that. Where is the, what is the true underlying fear? Because I feel like, you know, they could figure out how to monetize anything, including natural medicine and, and make just the same amount of money. But there seems to be a mm. fear of it. Where do you think that stems from? What is that fear? Great question. And something I think about a lot, actually. I think we have to look at history to understand why this is the case. So earlier on, there was in within the scientific traditions, there was this idea of uh, vitalism, where there were certain scientists that really believed in this vital force of the body. They believed in the natural healing of the body and this kind of thing. And there was another branch of people who said, that's all BS. Everything is physiological. Everything is physical. And sometime I think it was around like the 1800s, late 1700s, there was a sharp split. And a lot of the vitalist theories were kind of quote unquote disproven. So the whole theory was thrown out together. 
So there's like a kind of wound in medicine and a wound in science where they just like don't want to talk about any of that kind of stuff because they're like, we already disproved that stuff and let's not get back into that rabbit hole. But they dip- um, they disproved it at the turn of the 20th century, you're saying, right? Is that the time I got right? Yeah, so yeah. They disproved yeah, like it with 1800s, with, 1900s. Yeah. Well, 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 would we could we would consider that almost like ancient medicine at this point. So they disproved yeah. something with techniques that we would consider disproven in a way. Now. Yeah, and there's um and th- that's like one factor of it. It's also in just like the general um one has to also bring in the personality types and the temperament types. And remember that the type of person who is likely to be a, like a materialistic scientist is a very particular type of person. And they're already the person who naturally is not intuitive, usually Aristotle who is not pattern-based. They're Aristotle people. <laughs> and that's, they're great. They're great. But they, but they don't see the whole other side of the equation, which the more uh, holistic people do that you know, might have ended up in quantum physics and not even in uh, science. That's why quantum physics theories might be so weird sometimes because some of those people in physics can really think outside the box because they do, they're scientists still, but they think differently. They're interested about the nature of reality. Um, so I think that's one factor. There's like a historical element, I think. And then, you know, that historical element is reiterated and they're still kind of teaching science in that kind of way. And there's this, there's also a kind of, uh, what Carl Jung would call it a zeitgeist. Okay. Uh, which is the, a spirit of the times, and the spirit of the times is is materialistic. The spirit of the times, uh, Carl Jung called it in these days. He said back in the days, you know, during the Inquisition, medieval times when Christianity was very strong, it was the soul torturing the body. Right. Every the, it was all about the soul, and the body was the enemy. Now he said in these times it's the opposite. He said it's the body torturing the soul, meaning that. There, it like the sense of meaning or there being a purpose or spirit is at question and ridiculed, and that's just like a general, fundamental, I think, evolutionary stage that humans are going through. So that comes in. This kind of ties into the conversation because it's like, how did I get into natural healing and natural medicine? It was from this like philosophical, spiritual perspective. So that's like that's somehow tied in there, uh, in a deep sense. So if somebody fundamentally doesn't believe there's any meaning in life. They don't believe in anything outside of the physical. They don't believe in any kind of greater force. They're naturally going to think natural medicine is BS because a lot of natural medicine is based around the idea that, you know, the body has a wisdom to heal, that nature is very wise and knows what to do and that we're not better than it. So essentially people with that mindset got into these authority positions and then created the legislator, the, the mindset, which kind of tortured the soul just kind of tortured this, this ethereal perspective. Yep. yep. And that's kind of the, all these, uh, you know, the enlightenment ideals, which although amazing, although they kind of saved people from the tyranny of religion, let's call it, uh, because it, obviously that was a dogma in and of itself. That was sure. really harsh on people. Uh, they kind of uh, did a complete 180, and we now live in the 180 where it was so resisted that now, you know, the problem in people's lives isn't, you know, how they live materially. It's how they live spiritually. People don't feel like they have meaning. People feel like they're lost. Like there doesn't seem to be really any purpose to their lives. There's nothing greater that they can work towards. That's really the fundamental issue of the times. And being a naturopathic doctor who's very focused on mental health. um, I think that this loss of meaning is a large part of this rise in mental, uh, uh, mental suffering that we have these days is because of that lack of that deeper meaning of life that, you know, used to be a given for people, but now it's like ridiculed. Well, part of it really is that we don't have any goals as a collective, not just as a country mm-hmm. or, or a region, but as a species, as humans, we don't have one goal that we're all individually working towards with our minor goals, whether it's personal success, business success, all the goals that are necessary to have a thriving, amazing life. We're not rooting those goals in the bigger goal. Some people are, but uh, most people aren't rooting those goals in the, in a greater goal, which could be creating heaven on earth, creating the earth where we're all together and it's the best possible situation. So they're feeling lost. They're feeling empty because they put their energetic, 
self, their complete self in the illusionary world without the extra spiritual aspect to kind of give them a broader perspective. So now they're kind mm-hmm. of lost. But if we had that, then we, we'd be working towards something. We wouldn't have the depression, the mental health issues that we see that we're facing so much right now. And it's a worldwide epidemic. But that's where mm-hmm. people like us come into play. You know, you're out there healing people. You know, you're creating a practice that's going to be healing people. I'm, and you have a podcast. You're giving a platform for people to talk about natural health. I'm here with my podcast in my world trying to help people evolve, help people getting to, the, to, to get to the next step. That's really what we have to do. You know, whether it's naturopathy or, or any practice, any spiritual practice, I think that that's really the next step is to give people a goal to work with. What do you think about that? I, I agree. You know, Joseph Campbell said that one of the biggest issues of our time is that we don't have a collective myth, right? In ancient times, there was a general collective myth, like in Greek times, where they believed about the gods and they believed about appeasing the gods and acting right in the face of the gods. And during, you know, when Christianity took its rise, there was the collective myth of Jesus, the savior, and everyone really lived their life based on this. So they actually, although there was a lot of dogma and issues with it, people in general live with much more meaning because they didn't have that same doubt that we have now about our religious views. Um, But in these times, we don't really have a collective myth. In fact, we don't even think that that's an important thing to have. And without a collective myth, you basically have no structure for why you're here, what are you trying to do with your life? How do you relate to other people? And in these days, we have to find our own collective myth. And a lot of it is going back to the roots. And that's part of the reason why I'm so interested in mythology, because I feel like it gives that framework and that collective myth to provide a meaning in life that isn't based around religious views, that is based around you know psychological principles, let's call them. Um, even when I started my company, Kataris Therapeutics, the idea was to tie in myth to it because... I just, I, it, it fascinates me. And I think that it, there's so much to be gained from studying uh, mythology and understanding it um, that fills that void of meaning in our lives and lets us actually live well. Oh yeah, I totally agree. And I think that uh, what myth does is it, it allows us to tap into the concept of the archetype, which is these, mm. they're, these univer- almost like a universal law, these energies that manifest in different ways through time, but manifests in the same way. And, and they're inner, you know, they're inside, they're outside. There's all these archetypes everywhere. And what myth does, it kind of hooks you up into that understanding without myth, without the archetype, things have a very limited meaning and, and it's artificial because it shifts with the times, people's perspectives, how they define things shift within cultures, within generations, so then nothing is really concrete except for the myth. So without the myth, we're just kind of like <laughs> meandering in the dark. But I do want to talk a little bit, uh, Bogdan, about your company, you know, uh, Kentaros Therapeutics. So you have a bunch of blends, uh, herbal blends that you created. Tell me a little bit about those. Sure. Yeah. So I started this company about uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, what it is mainly, we're going to get into teas and things like that, but it's medicinal tinctures. So tinctures are uh, liquid extracts, and we use two different processes to pull out the medicinal qualities of the herbs that we use, which are all um, organic and all from local uh, farms in Oregon. So the the alcohol-based tinctures, which are kind of our high-potency formulas, they extract all of the fat-soluble and the water-soluble ingredients of the plant medicines. And then we have our um, alcohol-free versions for people who are you know, sensitive to alcohol or children or anybody who doesn't want alcohol in their uh, plant medicine. Those ones are made from organic vegetable glycerin. Those also pull out a lot of the constituents and they taste really sweet like a syrup. Um, we have uh, 11 blends now. Uh, and we're going to get into teas and supplements as well, like uh, capsules and powders and things like that. But for now, we basically, a lot of our most popular blends are uh, one of the ones that uh, you had from your partner, Bryn, uh, the Blissful Soul, which is a, a mood regulation tincture. And that one has uh, fresh wildcrafted St. John's wort, milky oats, passionflower, lavender. Then we have blends that help with liver, uh, liver detox. We have blends that help with 
uh, mind, cognition, memory, ones that help with boosting the immune system, ones that boost digestion, uh, reduce stress, increase energy, decrease allergies, decrease pain. We have all these different formulas that are made around uh, like a fundamental issue that someone might have. And if they want to deal with it naturally with uh, carefully selected synergistic herbs, that's what the formulas are for. And these are herbs that, uh, these are blends that you made with all your knowledge. This is all the accumulated knowledge that you've learned through philosophy, myth, and naturopathy. You've fused all that information into how you designed these blends. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, all right. that's right. Yeah. So <laughs> a lot of, um, a lot of the, uh, research I did for these blends comes from the kind of traditional Western herbal traditions like folk herbalism and also research-based herbalism. So that's kind of how I came up with the blends, um, uh, trying to make all the ingredients synergistic. Because the, the thing is, when I don't see the person in a herbal consult, I kind of need to make the medicine a little bit more general for right. people because I don't know what the specific issue is. But So that's why I picked like the most common, biggest hitting herbs, that are, you know, definitely backed by research, no obscure stuff, no toxic herbs. Like you can drink a whole bottle and nothing bad will happen to you type of herbs. And uh, you can get these, gentle, uh, like chamomile and things like that. And if you're interested people out there worldwide, you can do ship worldwide. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's okay. Correct. Cool. Yeah, we so do free shipping, free shipping. Really free. Yes, well, yes. yeah. Okay, good. Let's go to KT herbs. That's where everybody should go. If you're interested, we're going to find out all the places where Bogdan is. But if you want his herbal blends, the Kentaro Thera therapeutics, you go to KT cat Thomas KT herbs, just like that, you know, Kentaro's therapeutics, KT KT herbs.com. And that is his website where you can find the herbs. Um, but you can also find him on Instagram at, uh, at holistic underscore psyche. So go to Instagram. That's actually, I changed, I changed oh, no. that name actually. Oh no. What's yes. your new Instagram? Sorry. Erase yeah, that from your memory, people. Let, let's hear it straight no from problem. Bogdan. No problem. <laughs> well, you see that uh, I'm obviously very holistic psyche minded. So that was like my <laughs> pre brand that I was doing. I might bring it back as the clinic name. So, okay. But my Instagram name is different now. It's uh, at Dr. Dan, spelled out, like not D-R, doctor, but D-O-C-T-O-R, Dr. Dan um, underscore medicine man. So it's Dr. Dan underscore medicine man. Dr. Dan all spelled out. underscore medicine man, all spelled out. Yeah, it rhymes. Go there, <laughs> go there, follow that. And, you know, you also have the Herbal Hour Natural Health Podcast all your natural health information. Bogdan's here to tell us a little bit about it. You know, he's here giving us that information now, but he's got the podcast where he's talking about it 24 seven. You want absolute in-depth knowledge into the natural health world. Go to the herbal hour, natural health podcast. I'm sure you can find it on all the platforms, right? It's on Apple yeah, it's on all and the platforms. Spotify. Okay. It's everywhere. Good. Listen to that yeah, one. It's on YouTube as well too. We have uh, the videos uh, of the, live interviews the well, I guess they're not live interviews they're recorded yeah. yes oh cool okay yes. cool that's so youtube you can find them there so if somebody wanted to get a consultation from you personally where would they find that information yeah so i'm actually offering uh free herbal consults free initial herbal consults um no requirement to follow up afterwards kind of just like a general meeting to see what's going on with your health and some general herbs to help. And then if you're interested in the way I practice herbalism, we can continue onwards. You can contact me at Dr. Dan spelled out at ktherbs.com uh, and just say, Hey, uh, I want a free herbal consult or something like that. And we can start talking. Um, awesome. You know, because yeah, uh, as far as people need help out there, but go ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. They absolutely do. And I'm very happy. This is definitely my, my life's passion uh, to do this kind of work. So it makes me, I've known from a kind of pretty young age that, you know, one-on-one -on -one with people and helping them uh, find meaning in their lives, uh, balance their health, really just be like happy in all ways and free of pain and suffering was kind of always what 
drove me to to this path. So they but can as far as um oh sorry go ahead. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say so they can go to KT Herbs. They can get the herbs. They can uh, email you there and get the consultation and, and forward that whole process. I'm sorry. Go ahead though. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that uh, if you go to ktherbs.com uh, at checkout, use the uh, promo code oh, family, family. Uh, spelled just like that, uh, and you get 25% off. So I just wow. wanted to offer that. To you. Thank you. You know, let's uh, general family discount. Let's get the family discount. Let's order some herbs. ktherbs.com. I, 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 everyone should go there. Check it out. No pressure. Find what suits you. But then when you do find that thing that suits you, boom, you got 25% off with the family F A M I L Y. Put that in the discount box. You get 25% off. That's, that's pretty generous. Yeah, Thank and you. Free shipping. It's and and the free shipping. are fairly priced. So they're it's gonna come out to, you know, for uh, about a month or two supply under 20 bucks for one tincture. So absolutely it's definitely amazing. fairly priced. I'm not, you know, overcharging. What uh, a deal. While you're getting it out there, you're healing people, you're getting out your incredible medicine. You know, we got about 15 minutes left. So let's uh, you know, what are some of the things people can do? to strengthen their immune system right now naturally, because everybody's interested in strengthening their immune system. Mm -hmm. What do they can do? What can they do to do that? And also what are some of the habits that people can change in order to live a more healthier lifestyle in a general sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great question. Uh, to boost the immune system, looking at it, uh, holistically, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, starting off the easiest way that requires the least change is, to uh, use immune boosting herbs, things like elderberry, echinacea, astragalus, licorice root. In fact, one of the formulas on ktherbs.com is guardian angel, which has those. That's just an example of some of the most common ones. There's a lot of other ones. So if you do research, like type in immune herbs or pick up an herb book and look through and see which ones, there's a lot that are used kind of over time to boost your immune system, not just when you are sick, but to help you uh, prevent from getting sick things like ginger, garlic, anything really spicy and warm, especially during the cold winter. Those are amazing when you are sick or just to prevent it. There's a recipe you can make. It's uh, called a fire cider. Some of your listeners might be familiar with it. It's um, essentially a vinegar-based tincture where you take garlic, horseradish, uh, ginger, and onions. You chop them all up and you mix them Sorry, this thing is... Oh, no worries. <laughs> fire cider. Oh the magical fire cider. It's, you know, it's an ancient recipe. Somebody tried to trademark the name recently. They couldn't it do did, it. It did, yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. Anyway, so back to the fire cider. Yes, so fire cider. You got your horseradish, ginger, garlic, onions, cayenne, a little bit of cayenne. You chop it all up, blend it up, mix it in some organic apple cider vinegar. Um, and then you can add other things. You can add rose hips, you can add lemon, other things that are kind of sour that have vitamin C to boost your immune health as well. Vitamin C is a great supplement to take. Vitamin D also. Uh, you basically set that fire cider aside, close it up, set it aside for a month, and then just drink little teaspoons of it every day. You know, add it to your salad dressing, add it to, you know, water and drink it. You could drink it in the morning. Like some people drink uh, uh, apple cider vinegar in the morning, but this will be a kind of more medicinal version of that. So that's a great, just like very easy way to uh, boost your immune health from the herbal side. From the uh, lifestyle side, and these tips of course apply to just living healthily because if you are healthy, your immune system is healthy. It's just, it, it, there's just no other way. You know, it's, if your body is healthy, then your body has resources to have a good immune response. So the more healthy your body is, the more healthy your immune response is. So these tips, really apply to just being healthy in general. Um, things like getting regular movement. The recommendations are for getting, you know, 30 minutes of movement at least four times a week. Something that really works up a sweat. Something that really gets your heart going. Could be, you know, it could be just going for nice long walks. It could be, you know, doing some stuff at home, doing some push-ups, pull-ups, look up a program, do some yoga, whatever. You really just want to find something that you really love doing. Uh, to get your body moving, because that's one of the best things the immune system needs is uh, movement, uh, exercise, that kind of thing. Personally, I really like doing martial arts. 
So I do kickboxing, uh, Muay Thai specifically. It's Thai kickboxing. Oh, wow. I was just in uh, class yesterday uh, doing some sparring. So that's like really intense. I like the vigorous activity. It, it, I love it. I'm passionate about it. It doesn't feel like a workout. It feels like a workout, but it doesn't mentally feel like, oh, I don't want to go. You know, It feels like, oh, I'm excited to go. So find something like that where you're excited to do it and just do it. And then that's that's from the exercise standpoint. Obviously, there's a lot of other general things like you know doing some mindfulness activity like prayer or just uh, focusing on your breathing, doing some yoga for like 10 minutes every day, something to lower the stress response because cortisol and the stress response directly inhibit the immune system. So if you're always stressed out, your immune system is going to be weaker. And that's what's unfortunate about this whole situation is there's so much fear and hysteria which is exactly the kind of thing that makes people's immune system weaker, which is exactly the kind of thing that you don't want happening when there's an epidemic going around. So Mm. stay cool. Don't believe the hype. Uh, Just (laughs) focus on your body, focus on your health, stay safe, obviously do what you need to do, but don't think that you're like weak. Think that, you know, your body can defend. I mean, that's what it's made to do. It's not, you know, illnesses are not new to the human body, you know, like we've been at it for millions of years with bacteria and viruses. So don't think that we don't have, you know, some things up our sleeve when we're healthy. Yeah. Trust your, uh, trust your immune system, trust your nervous system, trust your natural functions. You know, one thing that I discovered, uh, about a year or so ago, which revolutionized my health and, and this isn't, this is just my own advice. It's not professional advice, but I've been taking high doses of iodine and that has Ooh. radically transformed my health. Um, Interesting. Well, what I re- realized, what I learned is that all hormones are made out of iodine. So if you don't have the right amount of iodine, then you're, use, you're building your hormones from bromine. And if you live in a fluoridated area, fluoride. So fluor- you're using bromine and fluoride to build these hormones if you don't have the correct amount of iodine. Once I figured that out and I started taking what I feel is the correct amount of iodine, I've been recommended by other people, but it's very much above the RDA. It's like 60,000% above the RDA. But I personally, I'm not giving medical advice, but I personally take 25 micrograms or milligrams, 25 milligrams of uh, iodine every day. And it changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. Iodine is uh, specifically uh, for thyroid hormone formation. So it has a lot to do with the metabolic process of the body and things like that. Um, do you know a lot about uh, it? Have you, have you looked into iodine very much in your practice? Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, it's definitely something that's used a lot for, so if you have iodine deficiency, the tendency is to have hypothyroidism, meaning under uh, functioning hypo, uh, under functioning thyroid gland function, which is seen by things like always feeling cold, just like putting on tons of weight, feeling sluggish, brain fog, a lot of, you know, just vague symptoms can come from hypothyroidism. Um, so iodine can help those people that are deficient in iodine um, specifically to help make more thyroid. The issue is though, I would, I would be careful with taking super high doses without consulting your doctor because you can induce kind of issues with the thyroid. Like uh, really, really high doses of iodine can cause like goiter, which is when your thyroid gland swells. Sure. I don't know if you've ever had that, but so, so be careful. Uh, I don't know too much about super high dosage use. You probably know a little bit more than uh, me, but I do know that iodine is really good for the thyroid. Oh yeah. You should yeah. check it out. Japanese people th- that live on the coast get like uh, 35 milligrams per day. And oh, wow. so, so they, that's uh, seaweed and stuff. Yeah. And the, and the seafood it's uh, well, what I've realized is for, for me, it's for mental health. Like if for like, to, you know, living in Oregon, there's no sunshine here. You take vitamin D. Yeah, that's true. But in order to raise your serotonin levels, in order to maintain your focus, the, the high potency iodine has been amazing for me. So that's just my, my two cents <laughs> in the natural awesome. health world. But I just want to say thank cool, you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bogdan, Mark, 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 Chuck. McCart Chuck. I got it yes. right the first time. Not at the end. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I want everybody to go to the website, ktherbs.com. Let's check out what he's about. And you know, we'll have you back on. You know, you're an incredible human being. It's been a great podcast. I, I yeah, I'd love to. Let's let's have you back on in the future. And just uh let's hold for me through the outro music and we'll talk a little bit more. People, we'll see you next sure, episode. Thank you for having me on. Midnight on Earth.